I'm Joyita Gupta, and this is The Pulse. They train just as hard, play just as hard, and want to win just as badly. Gone are the days when athletes with disabilities were perceived as less than their able-bodied counterparts. Today, Paralympic athletes and games attract wide audiences, enthralled by the level of competitiveness and superb sportsmanship. We've come a long way from thinking about parasport as a form of disability rehabilitation. People with disabilities spend their entire lives devoted to sport, pushing themselves, going beyond their personal best. And while it's well and good to be impressed and even inspired by our favorite athletes, para-athletes have blown the perceptions of people with disabilities as somehow being objects of pity right out of the water. Today, we discuss parasport and determination. It's time to put your finger on the pulse. Hello and welcome to The Pulse on AMI-audio. Thanks again for joining me, and we are really excited to be talking to you, as we have been over the next, over the last couple of weeks, about the Canada Disability Hall of Fame and some of the people being honoured at this year's luncheon. You've already heard in the last two episodes from Chantal Benoit and Michelle Stilwell. Today we'll be meeting a final, uh, a final person being honoured at the Canada Disability Hall of Fame. I want to remind you before we get into talking about our guest that if you have not as yet done so, please don't forget to like or subscribe to this channel so that you can be notified about future episodes and get more content. We cover all kinds of disability issues, not just parasport, but we talk about research, healthcare, education, you name it. If you have an interest and a passion for disability rights and you are keen on following the latest news, research and developments on disability issues, do remember to subscribe to this channel. My guest today is Natalie Wilkie. Natalie Wilkie is a Canadian Paralympic cross-country skier. She was the youngest member of Team Canada at the 2018 Paralympic Games. She won gold, silver and bronze medals. Wilkie has since gone on to have a celebrated career. Natalie Wilkie is the recipient of the King Clancy Award and podium check at the 30th Canada Disability Hall of Fame luncheon. Natalie joins me today from her hotel room. Hello, Natalie. How are you? So good to have you on the program. Hi, um, I'm good. How are you? I'm honored to be on your show. Uh, Natalie, tell me a little bit about what it means to you to be the recipient of the King Clancy Award. I mean, you won a lot of medals. You're a you have a lot of accolades to your name, but what does this particular award mean to you? Um, I mean, I'm honored to be given this King Clancy Award. It means a lot to me um, just because it's in recognition of well, spreading awareness of people with disabilities. Um, I mean, the Canadian Foundation for Physically Disabled Persons has a goal to spread awareness of um, the achievements of disabled persons, which I think is so important in creating a bit more of a spotlight on disability well, people with disabilities, their achievements. I mean, in a world where like able-bodied sports really takes a precedence, I think it's super important to have a bit more equality in that sense. Now, you have really made a name for yourself with cross-country skiing. How did you get your start? Um, well, I started cross-country skiing, I mean, basically as soon as I could walk because I grew up a few kilometers from my local ski hill. Um, so it was just something my family did on the weekends, just like, well, my mom had four kids and we were all like crazy hyper all the time. So cross canoe skiing was a great way for us to kind of get rid of some of that energy. Um, so like I did the jackrabbit program as a kid um, and then moved up into the race team eventually when I was ready and started racing from there. And that's kind of where I got my start. And did you realize at the time that this was something you were passionate about and that you were good enough to maybe someday, one day compete internationally and represent your country. Was that on the horizon for you or did did you just get your start in cross-country skiing as many people do as something fun that you did with the rest of your family? Honestly, I used to hate skiing. <laughs> when I was a toddler, the only way my mom could get me to go out for a ski was to bribe me with snacks or like maybe a hot chocolate at the end. Um, I don't know how many tantrums I had in a snowbank because I didn't want to be there. 
Um, but I think once I joined the Jackrabbit program and was able to like ski with my friends and my leader of my program always brought cookies in her backpack. And I think that was the big deciding factor on me beginning to like skiing. Um, yeah, it wasn't until like later when I started training and racing more that I really began to enjoy it and had dreams of bigger competitions. And it's when you started skiing, you started at the age of four, you were participating in able-bodied skiing. There was an accident in high school, which changed the course of your life to an extent. Tell us a little bit about the accident and what happened to you. Yeah, so I was 15 years old when I had my accident. And up until then, I had already been racing able-bodied competitions, um, just mainly like local competitions within my home province of BC. Um, and I had gone to nationals actually a couple months before my accident. And that was like a nationwide, well, all of Canada, that was a big competition. And I didn't do particularly well, but it was kind of a turning point for me because I was watching all these Olympians and national team athletes who were competing there with me. And that kind of inspired me like, wow, this would be something really cool to do. But then a few months later, um, I was in woodshop class and I think it was the last week of school and I'd finished all my projects and I was working on something extra. Um, and unfortunately the project I was working on, the machines weren't set up for it because it wasn't one of the usual projects that all the students were doing. Um, and so unfortunately um, the machine kicked back when I was plating a piece of wood and I wasn't using a push stick unfortunately. And so my hand kind of went into the machine and got stuck. So I pushed the emergency stop button as soon as I could. And yeah, I was stuck in the machine for an hour while my teacher and a couple other people were trying to take it apart. Um, and then I was like airlifted to um, the nearest hospital where I had surgery immediately. Um, unfortunately, I lost four fingers on my left hand, um, but I knew it could have been a lot worse. So I did feel lucky that that was the only thing that had happened. But at the time, like it did crush all my dreams. Like I said before, I was like starting to think like, wow, crossing to skiing could be a cool path to follow. Like I wonder where I could go with this. And then after having my accident, I realized like I, well, I didn't think that would ever be a possibility ever again. Oh, wow. And you must have been terrified about what the future would hold for you. But I read somewhere that you were back skiing a little over two weeks after that accident. Is that true? That's true. <laughs> Um, I think at that point, I really just wanted to... So what happened? I wanted to get back into a routine. I mean, I had been like training more or less full time that entire spring after my first national competition. Um, and taking two weeks off, staying in the hospital, having to like sit around at home was the hardest two weeks I've ever done. And so my doctor told me two weeks is like the amount of time that you have to take off. And then after that, you can start like walking or running or even skiing again. Um, and yeah, I followed that to the letter, like two weeks, I was back on the treadmill, like trying to walk, gain my fitness back. Um, and my coaches helped me develop a strap so I could like try and use two poles again. It didn't work super well. Um, but it did get me back into training and sport and like back into routine. And I really credit that for getting me through a really difficult time. Mm -hmm. No, I bet it must have been a huge thing to be able to go back to something that you had started to really enjoy doing and something that you saw a future in. Who is it that talked to you about now participating in the Paralympic Games and saying, well, maybe you could or you couldn't participate in able-bodied cross-country skiing, but look, there's still the option to compete and to represent the country in the Paralympic Games. Do you remember what that conversation was like? Yes. Um, so actually at the time, I didn't even know what the Paralympics was, or at least didn't know very much about it, which I'm really embarrassed to say now. Um, but I, I'd actually like the Paralympics wasn't on my mind until months later. Um, I mean, a few months later, my coach contacted the head of Cross Country Canada um, to see if there was like any para programs that I could join or kind of try out. Um, and so I did join a, kind of like a try at camp where I was skiing with one pole and I was surrounded by other athletes who had similar disabilities to me and athletes who were in sit skis. And it just was kind of a turning point, like <laughs> seeing all these athletes. Uh, I'm curious about how uh, para cross country skiing might be different from able-bodied skiing. Did you have to change your technique in any way? Yeah, greatly. Um, I mean, for me with, I just ski with one pole instead too. So it's not as big of a difference as like, say someone who switched from cross-country skiing able-bodied 
into skiing in a sit ski. I feel like that's the biggest difference. Um, but even like switching to one pole, that was a huge shift in technique because obviously like it gets a little bit harder to like one of the techniques we do is double pole where you use both your poles to propel yourself forward. And obviously with one pole, that's a little harder to do. So you just kind of have to adapt and shift your technique with that. And that's something, um, I mean, I'm still working on technique to this day. It's, it's a never ending process. <laughs> I'm curious about that a little bit because bear in mind I haven't uh, I haven't ever done cross country skiing of any kind. So you'll you'll have to excuse me if this is an ignorant question. You've had a lot of success with cross country skiing, and I'm curious about how much of that comes down to skill and refining the technique. As you said, it's a ongoing process, and whether there's a, also maybe a component of strategy to uh, determining how to best negotiate a particular slope or a, a particular course. Uh, as just as I said, as someone who really has no familiarity with cross-country skiing, how much of that comes down to developing your technique, and how much of that, and and how much of it might be uh, having some kind of a strategy as you approach a competition? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think cross-country skiing, besides being one of the hardest endurance sports in the world, is also extremely hard to master the technique. I mean, like I said before, it's an ongoing process. There's always going to be like a few niggly things that you're working on your entire career. So I would say like skill and technique is a huge part of being a skier. Um, but yes, yeah, strategy and tactics also really come into play. I mean, you have to know your own personal strengths and weaknesses and kind of play to that on the course. Um, like if you're really good at like downhills and corners, like maybe that will become your focus in a race. And especially if you're skiing with other people, um, sometimes we do mass starts where everybody starts at once and it's kind of first across the line who wins. Um, you really have to have a plan. Um, I mean, I always write a race plan the night before, um, just on how I'm going to tackle the course and how I'm going to ski with other people, because you need to know when to hang back, when to push forward, um, how not to get into a tangle and crash because that happens quite often. So yes, I would say there's a lot of strategy and tactics and thought involved when racing. When you, um, when you think about how far you've come as an athlete, and when you think about the fact that you've now had the chance to represent Canada at the Paralympics and at other international events, what is it that draws you to that level of competition? I think the challenge of personal development is what I'm most focused on. I mean, it's one thing to win competitions, but I think it's a whole other ball game to set goals for yourself um, developmentally. Like maybe it's a certain technique that I'm working on or maybe I just want to ski a race like tactically well and I have like a plan and a goal that I want to execute. Um, so it's not even just about the results. It's about the specific goal that I have for that race. Um, after each race, I always ask myself like, what went well? What didn't go so well? What could I do next time? And I think that really keeps it interesting and keeps the challenge high. And I mean, every single race is different. There's gonna be different people racing. There's gonna be different conditions. Um, and certain courses play to other people's strengths or maybe your strengths. And so there's always like something fresh or new or exciting or challenging going on. You have uh, you are one of the busiest people I have ever had to chase down as a producer. Um, I would phone you or I would email you and you'd be training or you'd be doing something <laughs> else. A lot has been made of the fact that you are, uh, or, or at least were in 2018, one of the youngest members of Team Canada. And I'm curious about how, as a young person, you might have balanced the need to train and compete in cross-country skiing with, well, having a life and hanging out with your friends and going to the movies and doing all the other things, you know, keeping up with academics. What's been your strategy to achieve work-life balance? Um, I would say, like, especially around my first Paralympics, I was 17, just turned 17. And so I was still in high school, had a year and a half to finish. Um, and the way I balance like training and a social life and after school activities was just like knowing my limits, um, knowing how much like I could personally handle. I mean, sometimes <laughs> my social life took a bit of a hit um, when I needed to train. But I think the other thing was I was also in a training group with a lot of my friends. And so I could kind of combine social time with training time, which I know not a lot of people are lucky enough to be able to do. Um, and then, yeah, just around school, being really efficient with my time. I remember I had like a 40, 45 minute bus ride to and from school. And so I would use that time to study or work on projects. 
um, just because I knew like I would have training right after school so wouldn't have as much time as most people. How much time do you spend training nowadays and what does your typical day look like when you have to be training for a major competition? Um, currently, my yearly hours for this year are at 750. Um, so that like, usually for me is like 10 to 25 hours per week, depending on the training phase. Um, it totally varies depending on the time of year, like in the summertime. Um, we really try and like bump up our hours. So that's when we get more of the 20 to 25 hour weeks. Um, I'm at a training camp right now in Mammoth Lakes, California. That's why I was so hard to get a hold of. And we're training twice a day from three to sometimes five hours per day. Um, so, I mean, it doesn't sound like that much time, but it ends up taking up a lot of time because then you get super tired from the training and like sometimes you have to nap and you also have to like prepare for the training. So it ends up being more hours than you'd expect. How much of it is just, you know, there's obviously the actual skiing part of the training, but I'm sure there are other components to the training as well. Going to the gym, uh, nutrition must be a really big part of it as well, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have a team nutritionist who we work with quite often just on how to um, adequately fuel for training during training after training. Um, it's quite a science. I feel like I've learned a lot the last couple of years about fueling my body. And yes, it's not all just skiing. Um, well, in the summertime, we roller ski, which is kind of like roller skating, but with poles. We also hike, we run, we bike, um, we go to the gym, we have like a lot of different modes of training. And a lot of us will have kind of like a daily activation that we do like before training or just like on its own, just to address like any weaknesses that we might want to fix. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's quite a variety of things that we do. Outside of cross country skiing, do you have any other hobbies and passions that you like to pursue? Yeah, I'm super into painting and photography. Um, I've been kind of artistic, like since I was young, I was like the kid who was like drawing on everything. Um, I have the art around my family's home on like walls and windows and everything to prove it. <laughs> my mom wasn't super happy, but a lot of <laughs> my art is still on the walls. Um, yeah, and then like uh, I started getting into photography a couple of years ago. And another thing that a lot of people are surprised to hear is um, I have five horses. <laughs> I'm a farm girl. My family lives on a hobby farm. And yeah, I haven't been able to spend as much time at home the last year as I would have liked. But um, they're in BC. I'm in Alberta. So it's a few hours to drive home. But I spend as much time at home as I can. And yeah, I love riding, um, training horses just hanging out in the peace and quiet of living out in the country. What do you like? I mean, there's obviously the hanging out in the peace and quiet in the country, but what else is it that captivates you about training horses? I, You're actually the, probably the first guest I've ever had who is interested in training horses. So what is it that gets you so excited about doing that? Um, honestly, like the challenge, I guess. And I feel like horses have taught me so much about myself too. I didn't think I would ever get into training horses. But a few years ago, my family um, bought a few rescues and they were untrained. And we had a trainer work with one of them. And I was always like hanging out around her and kind of like watching what she did. And I got like super interested. So I like rented books from the library. I watched YouTube videos and I just kind of like tried to do it myself, which obviously like made the journey like a lot longer than if I would known what I was doing. But I learned so much along the way. Um, and I think really like the best part of training horses is the partnership that happens between you and your horse. I mean, you get to know each other so well. Um, the communication gets so refined and I just find it like really, really special to be communicating with another being on such a level. And you've got five horses now. Are they, uh, um, you know, are, are some of them older, some of them younger? Like, What's the age range there? Um, most of them are around 10 years old, I'd say, give or take a few years. We have one pony who I grew up riding on. He's in his 20s now, and my younger sister is riding him now. But yeah, so there is quite a range of the ages of the horses we have. Oh, that's very nice. You also mentioned you like to paint. Uh, what is you know What kind of painting do you do? Is it watercolor? Do you have other types of painting that you're interested in? Is it mostly landscapes that you're doing or portraits? Uh, tell me a little more about the painting that you're doing. Yeah, um, I kind of do a bit of everything. <laughs> I love watercolor, especially for on the road. Um, I usually bring some like a watercolor pad and pencils and brushes with me just because it's like easy and portable. Um, and you can, I don't know, I feel like that's like the easiest to do when you're traveling. 
Um, when I'm home, I love painting with acrylics and oils on canvases. Um, and I would say like what I paint greatly varies in like what kind of mood I'm in. Um, I do paint a lot of animals and portraits of people, um, but sometimes I just love painting landscapes too. So it, it really varies. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Uh, coming back to talking about cross-country skiing, I wonder if you've given some thought uh, to what impact your legacy as an athlete or your accomplishments as an athlete may have for people with disabilities in general and you know whether you perceive some kind of a linkage between uh, your ability to compete as a parasport athlete, breaking down barriers for people with disabilities uh, in general. Yeah, I mean, I hope with like what I've done, I can inspire people to hopefully do the same, if not more. I feel like I have a pretty unique story going from a traumatic shop accident to Paralympic champion. Um, and I don't know, like I'm just saying that because it's not something that I would have ever expected of myself. Um, I don't think I mentioned this before, but when I did decide to go to the Paralympics, I mean, I qualified a few months before at a World Cup in Canada, and I was really unsure if I should actually even go or not, because I didn't think I was at the level to be able to compete on the world stage. And embarrassingly enough, I was a little worried about missing all the school <laughs> to go to the Paralympics because it's two weeks in, um, I mean, away from school. Um, but I am really glad I went. I went just for the experience, just to, like have a bit of fun. My mom ended up like flying to South Korea as well to watch me race. Um, and so it was like a huge shock, <laughs> a huge surprise when I did really well and won medals. Um, so I just like hope that my story can inspire people to know that, I mean, anything is possible. Um, just like follow your dreams. And even if they're big and scary, um, more often than not, I mean, if you reach for the moon or what's that saying? You shoot for the stars, land on the moon. That's kind of what I feel like in this situation. Just just go for it and see what happens. That's a really amazing way to look at life. Uh, you still have, I mean, you're still quite young uh, and you have years, if not decades ahead of you. What else are you aspiring to do? Um, I have some bigger goals for this season. Um, I mean, I've already reached a lot of my goals in cross country but this season um, we are having bath on world championships in prince george so it'll be a home world championships and bath on is something that i've been struggling with the last few years i had a fairly good season last year and so i hope to keep that momentum going and maybe snag a couple of podiums at this bath on world championships especially like on home soil like um, my family is going to come watch and um, i really want to do well in front of a home crowd and yeah, I'm also hoping to compete in a few able-bodied races in December and January and just see how far that can take me. So I've got a few different challenges and goals set up for this season and we'll see how it goes. That sounds amazing. Natalie Wilkie, thank you so much for speaking to me today. It was a pleasure to have you on the program. Thanks. It was a pleasure to be here. Natalie Wilkie is the recipient of a King Clancy Award and podium check at the 30th Canada Disability Hall of Fame luncheon. And that wraps up our coverage of the Canada Disability Hall of Fame. You've now heard from three remarkable people, each of whom has been a trailblazer for the disability community. If you have any feedback about any of the preceding episodes, you feel free to drop us a line. You can write us an email, feedback at ami.ca. You can also give us a call at 1-866-509-4545. That's 1-866-509-4545. And don't forget to leave permission to play the audio on the program. You can also find us on X, formerly Twitter, at AMI Audio, and use the hashtag PulseAMI. This week, The Pulse has been brought to you by the following people. Videographer, Ted Cooper. Video editor, Jordan Steves. Technical producer, Mark Aflalo. Rand Alahanty is the coordinator for AMI Audio Podcasts. And Andy Frank is the manager for EMI Audio. And I've been your host, Joita Gupta. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.